Hello, we're Studio Swine. A question we get asked all the time is, why swine? But we're not going to talk about that today. And it's not because it stands for super wide interdisciplinary new explorers. Instead, we're going to talk about Gonzo. And by Gonzo, we mean Gonzo journalism that was pioneered by Hunter S. Thompson in the 1970s. And it's a style of journalism that was written in an energetic first person um, participatory style. Uh, which the author is often the protagonist. And we were really inspired by this approach of investigative journalism and wondered how we could transfer this idea into something more tangible. So instead, the end product being a piece of written work, what if it manifested itself in an object? So over the last um, seven years, taking this gonzo approach, we've gone to the streets of Sao Paulo to make work with waste collectors. We've gone across the North Atlantic gyre to collect plastic and make work on board the boat. We've gone to the China, to the world's largest hair market, and um, made a new material with human hair. And we've gone deep into the Amazon jungle to um, collect natural rubber for a, a collection. We started working together seven years ago. And when we graduated from the Royal College of Art, we immediately wanted to leave London. It's a fantastic place to be, but we felt that as newly graduates, the opportunities were quite sparse, and we just wanted to make things happen. So we chose to move to Sao Paulo because it was cheaper than living in London, and we figured that there'd be a lot of exciting things happening over the next few years with World Cup and the Olympics. Um, so we uh, applied to a lot of residencies, grants, um, emailed a lot of people, but unfortunately, we never heard back from anyone. But when you believe in an idea as good as this, you just have to go for it, and you've got to make it happen no matter what. So one month later, we flew to Sao Paulo. And when we got there, we had to start looking for a place to live, and we must have picked the, the most awful, smelliest hostel in town, and it was so awful that we had to stay out as much as possible. But eventually, we found this lovely place on Craigslist um, that was totally unfurnished. It had no fridge, no cooker, no bed. But it did have two swimming pools. So we were like, we'll take it. And we ate raw food, um, ate, uh, slept on the floor, and went swimming every day. But most of the time, we spent exploring the city by foot, day in, day out. And everyone kept on telling us, you're going to get mugged. So we were walking around in the torrential rain with our money tucked in our socks, and we were thinking, what have we done? We had no opportunity, no plan. Our flights were three months away. And we've written to everyone we knew, and even our designer friend didn't want us to work for him for free. So at that point, we were thinking, we just have to do something, make things happen. Because, you know, no one, it's not going to happen otherwise. So we worked with what we had, which was the street. And it's a fantastic democratic space where, you know, anyone can make things happen. So we kept a blog called Daily Postcard from Brazil, where we posted what we found interesting around the street of Sao Paulo. And through doing this, we got to meet a lot of interesting people and got to go to lots of interesting places, like um, car bulletproofing workshop, carnival floats making workshop, um, got to meet uh, people who specialized in flood management and also went to dance classes five days a week. And we became really interested in this idea of vernacular design, which is an informal design that is a product of its region, its resources, and its culture. And often, vernacular design is improvised, meaning that what they make and how they make it is often dependent on what is available to them. So this man has converted a bicycle into a knife sharpener. And we started collecting a lot of street carts because it was really exciting to think of them as um, small fragments of mobile trades that can come together to create a city. 
And um, we were most interested in the Catadoras, which are the cart men that have their own carts made out of old car parts, and they go around the city collecting um, scrap materials, and it's something you'll find in all kinds of places. And we made friends with Eduardo and Paulo, who were down from the northeast of Brazil um, to Sao Paulo to make money from its kind of waste streams. And it really inspired us to think about a completely self-sustaining system and a new model of manufacturing where it's more flexible, it's on the, on the streets itself. And so we started collecting aluminium cans, and there's a lot of aluminium in Sao Paulo, and after a football game, you get like the streets just become rivers of cans. So there's a lot of aluminium, but we needed a way of melting it. So we created a furnace, and um, it's something that we wanted to also build from scrap materials. So we went to the largest scrap yard in Sao Paulo and got the materials for our furnace. And we went to a, just a garage and had these pieces welded up. So we had these wheels fitted so it could go down um, uh, steps, up and down steps. It has a leaf blower attached to um, an old car battery. And we needed a fuel for it to run on. And conventionally, um, you would, with a metal foundry, you'd run it on gas. But we needed a free fuel. And there's a lot of food markets around Sao Paulo frying foods. There's a lot of waste vegetable oil. And it's a fantastic fuel, because not only is it free, but it's really clean. It's only actually flammable when it gets really hot and it kind of goes into the furnace and turns into a gas. So you can have a great tub of it and it won't ignite beside it. So it's important that it's safe. And if it is thrown away, then it causes kind of blockages in drains and, and fat bugs. So it's actually a really great kind of second life for this um, material. And then we needed a mold to actually pour the aluminium into something. And conventionally, you might have cast iron molds or stainless steel molds, but they're very heavy, they're expensive, they're inflexible. And we didn't want to make hundreds of the same thing. We wanted to make kind of a cast on demand system, so it was very unique. So, Sao Paulo has a lot of building sites, a lot of surplus sand, and sand is actually a fantastic material to um, make sand molds with. And each one could be unique, and we could use materials that we collected on the street. And we really love when materials express themselves, so when aluminium is showing its like molten state, and when each is kind of unique, and it's something very different and very tactile compared to maybe the way we're normally um, interacting with it is very industrial and kind of globally homogenized. So we were made, able to make much more expressive, much more local things. And we, it resulted, um, the first um, collection was just a series of stalls for the street market that had provided all the materials. But the, taking this Gonzo approach and what we learned from it was that um, we're naturally quite shy people, and so by taking this approach, it really kind of gave us the opportunity to meet all these amazing people that inspired the project, and it was a project completely born of necessity that we wouldn't have ever thought of um, in our homes. We first heard about the problem of plastic in our oceans in 2010, and the UN estimates there to be over 100 million tons to be in our oceans, and with the rising plastic production, this figure is set to double in the next decade. And when we first heard this, we were just struck by how there's this bizarre situation in the history of the planet, that there's this synthetic material in all our seas, anywhere, everywhere in the world, and even in the most remote places. And we started asking ourselves, can we do anything with this material? But everyone told us no, because you can't recycle mixed plastic. But what we noticed was that no one had actually tried it. And as Einstein said, the only source of knowledge is experience. And we were curious to find out um, what was happening. So we phoned up the environmental agencies and found out that the most polluted, plastic for, uh, most polluted beach for microplastic is in a place called Porthown in Cornwall. And we drove out there for six hours from London, and when we got there, it was evening, so we slept in the car. And when we woke up in the, the next morning and got out of the car, the beach looked surprisingly pristine. But on a closer inspection, what we thought was um, these small beach pebbles were actually tiny pieces of plastic, and the beach was covered in them. 
So we spent a whole day collecting these plastic, and when we got back home, we made uh, a furnace out of scraps we could find um, to test melting this material so we can see how the material behaved. And we went through a few generations of this furnace, and we ended up with this model, which can be made for under 10 pounds with readily available materials that you can find in your own kitchen, and we posted online and made it open source. And the next thing we wanted to do was to take this furnace out to the sea with local fishermen, and whilst they fished on their boat, we collected plastic. And using this plastic, we made a stool for the fishermen to use, and each chair was tagged with geographical coordinates of where it was made. But what we really wanted to do was go out into the middle of the ocean, to where this plastic gathers in these swirling gyres. And we ran a Kickstarter campaign, and we managed to get a berth on a, a scientific sailing vessel called the Sea Dragon that would be leaving from the Azores, and it would be full of marine biologists and all kinds of um, interesting people. And the Azores um, islands, when we got there, were really interesting because they have a lot of maritime crafts. It was like a major whaling center until the 1970s when it was banned. And with whaling, this like horrendous industry, which was horrendous for the whales and actually for the crew as well because it was incredibly dangerous and um, they would have to do these Nantucket sleigh rides, it was called, um, and it was really deadly and then if they survived that then they'd have to butcher up this whale and boil down its fat and it was like uh, this kind of stinking smoky ship. And so to keep them from mutinying, they would actually um, have this kind of maritime crafts to do. So they'd do needlework and they'd do things like scrimshaw, which is the whale's teeth, it's kind of like ivory. They would scratch these designs into it with the kind of needle for repairing their sails at sea. And they'd scratch in these kind of scenes telling the story of their lives um, and the dangers of whaling. And in the 70s, obviously, whaling was less dangerous for them, at least. And um, they'd be wearing, like, 70s power suits, which we love. And it's a really tiny island, actually. So we'd been to the Scrimshaw Museum, we'd been filming there. And then one day, we were just walking around the town, and we suddenly saw um, this guy, Jose, um, just walking around, and we, we recognized him and interviewed him for our film about um, whaling. And so we went out to sea very much with this kind of inspired by maritime crafts, which were using the resources at hand. And we strapped this machine to the front of the boat, which is like a big parabolic uh, mirror that concentrates the sun into like a hot spot to melt our plastic. And we had to keep a 24-hour watch, because you're um, kind of sailing throughout the night 24-7. And so um, we would um, uh, yeah, be up at night watching the night sky, and we hadn't seen a ship for something like five days, not even distant on the horizon. And yet we always saw this bright light, which is the International Space Station going over our head. And we we're aware that actually that was the closest kind of people to us was in orbit. Um, but despite this remoteness, each day we trawled, we'd find little bits of plastic. But it's really difficult to collect at sea, because when it gets out to the gyre, 90% of it is um, less than a few millimeters big. You have to use these really fine nets, which also catch a lot of marine organisms. And um, you just collect such a tiny amount. And it becomes very pre precious, so like, your perception of the material changes from being just disposable to something you know, that you really cherish. So we made different objects at sea inspired by the idea of maritime crafts, and we made our own kind of whale's tooth, and we made various things, including this kind of tortoise shell. And we came back from the gyre expedition um, with this kind of renewed conviction that it was a really big problem, but our best place to solve it was actually at home on land. We found it so difficult to collect out in the middle of the ocean, but the beach naturally filters thousands of square miles of seawater for you for free without harming any organisms. All you need to do is scoop it up before it gets swept out again in the next tide. And the second thing, and the most important thing, is to obviously cut down our dependency on one-time-use plastics. So we had made these two films, and we'd made this big show, and we took it to Selfridges, to this, the London's biggest department store, and we had a show in Selfridges. And they actually banned plastic bags, and they banned the sale of um, disposable water bottles throughout all their stores. So it was all about engagement. 
<laughs> Thank you. Um, this is what we call an EII, which stands for an economically important insect. And it creates this, one of the most luxurious and prized materials in the world. And it created this, the most important route for cultural exchange. Not only it exchanged goods, it exchanged ideas, um, religion, aesthetics. And we were really interested in this notion of the Silk Road, and we wanted to find out the modern-day equivalent. This is a hair supermarket in East London. And in the shop, we used to always read the label, 100% human hair made in China. And we were really curious to find out, you know, who's growing these hair and um, what factories are processing it. And we did some research and we found out that China is the largest exporter of human hair and largest importer of tropical hardwood. And human hair grows more than 16 times faster than mahogany. And we love the materials like, you know, tortoiseshell, horn, tropical hardwood. But beauty is not just what you see, but what you know. So you don't want to use these precious materials now. So what we were trying to do was to create a material that mimics the aesthetics of these precious materials, but using human hair. So we kept on going back to the human hair market and experimenting, and we created sunglasses out of this material. But our dream's always been to go to China to investigate this hair market. And two years later, we finally got the opportunity. And when we got there, it was actually quite hard researching in person um, because it was just almost impossible to find anything online. So we did a lot of investigating ourselves, um, corresponding with um, factories and um, traders. And we kind of chased it down the supply chain and finally tracked down the location of the world's biggest human hair market in Shandong province. So after a three-hour bullet train ride and four-hour taxi um, right, we got to this small village that was shrouded in mist and uh, it was just very bleak. And we just had to rely on this very loose information of when and where it was taking place. So um, we got into this big hall and um, it was like uh, a Mad Max film. Suddenly this big bike gang arrived and they were all like in black leathers. Um, they had rabbit skins on the front of their bike and they had these big sacks on the back. And they began just trading um, human hair. And it's a bit like in a kind of good drugs movie where they say, follow the money. Well, we just followed the hair. So we'd just see who was buying the hair. And then we'd go up and say, can we film you? Can we kind of go oh, like wherever you're going next with it? And we followed it back to um, different factories and um, ended up visiting nine factories around um, this town. And there's this amazing transformation that happens, which is that hair is quite a disturbing thing. And you can feel a bit repulsed when it's like, you know, not yours or not a lo loved ones, and it's just interacting with it. But then actually, by the end of this kind of process, where it went through all this washing and drying and kind of combing, and it became this silken, beautiful material. And it was actually, and thinking about it as being one of the world's kind of like fastest growing renewable resources, it became quite different. So um, we were convinced that it was a beautiful material, but we were worried about our ability to convince others of that. And we we're going to be showing at uh, um, Design Miami Basel in Switzerland, like the kind of top art and design fair in the world. And we were going to be showing a collection made of human hair. We, we thought, we're crazy. Like, how are we going to ever make something that people would buy or be interested in? And um, we, it, that was a real spur, this fear of failure, to kind of really make something uh, as good as we could. And we were inspired by Shanghai Deco, so we made this collection, which is like this big dressing table and um, all these different objects. And so um, we were still thinking, who would actually buy this? And it turns out, no one. But, um, <laughs> but on the other hand, <laughs> Um, the film like, had 400,000 views in 24 hours. It went to National Geographic, and then all the projects has been touring the world since, so it wasn't so bad. <laughs> <laughs> so 
So, um, in 1927, Henry Ford bought a large area of land in the remote part of the Amazon rainforest to secure a source of rubber for his motor industry, and he called it Fordlandia. And he not only wanted to bring, um, grow rubber there, but he wanted to bring his idea of American-style civilization to the Amazon. And he employed local workers to clear 5,000 square miles of the forest. And it was completed in 1928. And it had workers' houses, hospitals, school, dance hall, um, everything. And the workers' houses were modeled in the American weatherboarded style and modeled on the streets of Michigan. And they even organized square dances every Sunday. And it had a fully equipped hospital. But there were a lot of natural obstacles that they had to overcome, and the biggest of those were within the plantation itself, where it was blighted with native pests and disease. And because in the Amazon, the rubber trees grow wild and are integrated within the forest, but Henry Ford ignored the advice of the botanist and planted trees that were too close to one another, so it meant that if one got diseased, it wiped out the entire crop. Also, um, there were problems with the workers who were unhappy with the nine to five working schedule in the tropical heat and the American diet and the prohibition of alcohol and gambling. And so they had a big riot in 1930 and fled the factory. And also the death toll was quite high. The workers suffered from malaria, snake bites, various tropical disease, and Fordlandia was a failure and it was sold back to the Brazilian government in 1945. And he said, a business that makes nothing but money is a poor business. For all his flaws, Henry Ford was also a true visionary. He was a vegan, he really believed in soya beans, and he had a lab for creating products out of soya beans. And here he's photographed wearing a suit made of soya bean fiber. In 1945, there was, short, there was a shortage of steel in America, and he created a, in an entire car out of soya bean plastic that was lighter and more fuel efficient. And he really believed in agriculture and industry going hand in hand. And he designed this city where half of the year the workers would work in the field farming and the other half they would work in the factory. And Frank Lloyd Wright famously said it was the greatest thing he'd ever seen. So we had to see it for ourselves, Fordlandia, although it was a total failure. Did it have some ideas worth revisiting? So we spent two days traveling deep into the Amazon rainforest. And once we were there, actually, in Fordlandia, it's full of the historical remnants of um, since the 1930s when it was somewhat abandoned. And in the center of this town is a big rubber processing factory, and it's filled with all the kind of tools and car wrecks, even coffins. And there's still the water tower, which is for many decades the tallest structure in the whole of the Amazon. And the graveyard, which is being washed away by the rains. And we visited the houses um, which the managers used to live in, and they're kind of just full of snakes now, and like this kind of utopian vision of this tiled bathroom is just decaying back into the jungle. But we're really interested in revisiting this um, thing with, with, with Henry Ford, who said failure is simply the opportunity to begin again, this time more intelligently. So we went to see the rubber tappers and how they live now, and we stayed with them deep in the forest with the totally self-sufficient um, tapping wild rubber trees. And they go around 100 trees a day tapping latex. And it's worth more than a kilo of beef. So if we can support the wild rubber, we're actually paying to kind of support the forest because we're seeing a lot of it being burnt down to clear for pasture. But the problem we had was rubber is beige. It's not very desirable. And so we turned it into ebonite, which is historically a kind of way of processing rubber to turn it into a kind of plastic. And it's this beautiful, polished material, but it's very hard to find any factories making it now. We found one of the last remaining, and we made wild ebonite. We wanted to make the collection reflecting the Amazonian forms. So we made this kind of living room um, as if Fordlander had been success. And we're using ebonite instead of hardwood. So again, it's kind of actually 
conserving the forest. We used fish leather from the Amazon as well, so they usually catch this fish for meat, but we could use the skin for leather. And they used to use ebonite before vinyl, so we made some records, palm leather sleeve. And we were really interested in connecting nature and industry and how, looking at our supply chains, we can actually pay to support our wild, wild areas. Um, our latest project is called New Spring, and what we were trying to do was to um, use technology to enhance the sensations of nature and to create something that has the wonders of the natural world. And it's essentially a tree-like sculpture that produces mist-filled bubbles that you can touch and handle when met with special fabric. And we think that one of the biggest questions of our, of our time is um, kind of how to achieve this synthesis between nature and industry. And this is a question that we've been asking for the past seven years. And the, our approach has been through Gonzo, which is by going out there and testing things in the real world and letting curiosity and desire lead us. And we often get asked, what's next? But the truth is, we don't really know what we'll be doing in six months' time, and we don't even know where we'll be. But we know that we'll be asking ourselves the same question and with the same attitude. One's destination is never a place, but a new way of seeing things. Thank you. Thank you.